Hello, everyone. Can I get a comms check? Can everybody either leave a comment in the chat, uh, say hello, something? I can see Mindy, so that's good. We got our presenter here. All right, Pi Friend can see us. Hello, Pi Friend. If everybody could just say hi in the chat, maybe let us know where you are dialing in from. We would love to see who is out there in the audience. Great. Thank you so much, John. Hello, Susanna. Austin, Texas. Oh, jealous. How is it warm there, Mindy? Warmer than it has been. It's about uh, oh, okay. 49 degrees today. Oh, all right. That's Better, better than what we've been doing here in Pennsylvania. We're I'm just sure. going to give it a minute or two here for everybody to get dialed in. At exactly 2.03, I'm going to, oh yeah, Philly Metro. I love it. I love seeing people from across the country in here. So we're going to get going in about 30 seconds. I just want to give everyone a chance to get acclimated and then we will get going. Okay. In three, two, one. Here we go. So hello, everyone. Happy Monday, all. Welcome to the Proposal Industry Experts Winter Education Series. Today's topic, using authenticity to steer clear of burnout in 2024. Whew, boy, do I need this one. Our speaker today is Mindy Berenblatt. And I'm Liz Kepner. I'm your host for this wonderful event. I'm a senior proposal manager at Mantech. And I'm a member of the Pi Baker's Dozen Advisory Board. I encourage you, if you're not already a member, join us at Pi at ProposalIndustryExperts.com. So we're so excited to have all of you here for this very relevant topic, because I don't know about you, but my January has been absolutely unrelenting so far. Like, it just came in. Oh, boy. Um, so a quick reminder, participate with us via the chat. We'll be monitoring for questions. Uh, we'll either answer them real time or we'll save them for the end as appropriate. And this will be recorded. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Mindy and we're going to get going. Thank you. Greetings, Pi. My name is Mindy Berenblatt. And because it is winter, I have a little bit of a scratchy throat. So if you see me taking sips of water, pauses, that's why. But all is well in Austin, Texas. And I'm so glad to be here talking to you guys about authenticity. Uh, but who am I and why should you listen to me? I mean, you know, you shouldn't listen to everybody. So I am here because I got to meet the amazing Ren and had a great conversation with her. And we were talking about burnout and authenticity and uh, so a little bit about me before we get into the bulk of that. I've been uh, in kind of the training education space for a really long time. I did teach for America and quickly learned um, how both fulfilling and exhilarating and exhausting being on the front lines of um, being a helper can be. And then I shifted into corporate learning, employee education, leadership training, and then I've spent the last 15 years in software education, but specifically the last eight or nine years focused on nonprofits, foundations, corporate giving, and really training in that software space. And so I feel like I've got kind of an interesting view of corporate America and how uh, some of the nonprofits and foundations and grant uh, writers, grant makers think. And so with that dual lens in mind, I wanted to share with you guys, because I know how exhausting work can be and how you can be pulled in so many different directions. And so before we get started, I actually wanted to share a quote that I shared um, last week on uh, LinkedIn. And I will drop my LinkedIn into the chat if you want to follow me. 
I talk, talk about customer education, but then I also talk about things like authenticity and um, wellness and mindfulness. So the quote I want to share with you is from someone named Ram Das, but it's ask yourself, where am I? Answer here. Ask yourself, what time is it? Answer now. Say it until you can heart it. So this idea of are you actually present or when you stand up, do you realize how badly you need to go to the bathroom and you've been ignoring all of the signals from your body and you haven't eaten lunch and you, you know, like that's, that's where that mindfulness piece of am I present even when I am incredibly busy. So <laughs> yeah, I get it. So right now, wherever you're sitting, I want you to just put your feet flat on the floor if you can and just kind of wiggle your toes a little bit and feel your toes on the ground and then feel that the ground is supporting you. And with that support, I want you to just kind of sit up maybe a little bit straighter, get a little bit more comfortable, maybe roll your shoulders back. You might realize that they're kind of up here and they don't need to be. You can just let them kind of settle in because we're going to be talking about how to stay in touch with what's most important to you. And that is that authenticity piece. So uh, I want to start with a story of when I did not do this well. It was the first time I took on a senior leadership role and I went into this role and I really I felt like I needed to meet or exceed expectations. I wanted to do my best. I needed to maintain the momentum of the business that I was taking over. And I wanted to stay open and learn from other individuals. And I took lots of feedback in and I, I really tried to incorporate a lot of feedback. And here's what I will tell you. Feedback is a gift and it can help shape you into a better version of yourself. But like any gift, some of them should be returned. You do not need to keep all of that feedback. I did not really hold to that. And so after about seven months, I was exhausted and I didn't even feel like myself. I didn't feel like I was leading in a way that resonated with myself. And so I, I just kind of had to really do a hard stop and say, okay, wait. I kind of got lost along the way. My goal to meet or exceed expectations meant that I was actually then trying to be a type of leader that wasn't resonating for me. And that's, it's exhausting to lead. It's exhausting to help others, but to do it not in your own voice and not feeling grounded in your own authenticity, you're doubling your exhaustion. And so I found uh, Brene Brown and I can't really, claim that I found her, but I, I came upon her work. How about that? And she has an exercise in, I believe it's the Dare to Lead book that is called the Values Exercise. Has anyone on this call heard of Brene Brown? We'll start there. Yes, no, chat. So there's at least one yes, I heard of her. I really recommend the book, her books. They're really interesting. She does a lot of research on vulnerability and authenticity. Very, very cool research. But she has a uh, an exercise called the values exercise. And I'll share the link. There's a list of, I mean, easily 100 different values. And the idea is you need to go through and figure out which three are most important. And she makes it very clear you are not allowed to have ties. You are not allowed to go more than three, right? You have to pick just three. It is surprisingly difficult. And so I went through this exercise and I realized, you know what? In order to lead and really stay myself, using those top three values would help me stay rooted in what's most important to me. And so I went through this exercise. None of these values are right or wrong. They're all really important values. 
But for me, the three that really stood out were, can I be clear? Can I be present? Can I be kind? Those three felt like if I cannot be those three things, then I am not being true to myself. And it's not as though uh, every single interaction is going to be perfectly aligned. But at the end of the day, if I could look back and say, clear, kind, present, okay, I'm at least at that baseline. And here's what I found. I found that that very much helped me to look at my day and how I spent my time and how I communicated with my team and with my peers. It really helped guide that because if I was starting to feel frustrated or uh, just bogged down, overwhelmed, I would think, okay, hang on. Am I being, and I would list my values, right? Your values may be different and that is perfectly fine. But am I being clear, kind, present in this moment? And sometimes the answer was yes. And it's just freaking frustrating, right? <laughs> Work and humans can be frustrating. That doesn't mean they're wrong. It doesn't mean you should run from the for the hills. So frustration is part of it. I'm not saying that this is going to get rid of all frustration. But some of the time I would find, oh, I'm actually trying to make them feel better, but by trying to make them feel better, I'm sugarcoating and not being clear. I need to be very clear on what I can and cannot do. I need to be very clear on what I say yes to and what I say no to. And I can do that in a kind way, but no is the ally of quality. And so I'm not going to say yes to everything. I'm not going to take all of the feedback that is given to me. I will bring it in. I will evaluate it, right? I don't want to just assume I don't have blind spots. But it really helped me to stay present by having these values. So I'm going to take just a moment. Control copy, control paste. I put the link and this is a list of values. This one happens to be from Brene Brown since I got the idea from her. I'm using her list of values. But honestly, you can do a Google search for you know personal values and you can find thousands of words. So if this doesn't feel like it's comprehensive enough or you're just like, I, I really want to read some more, just Google, right? Uh, but when you look at this list of values, I want everybody to just take a minute, take a breath and skim through and find a couple that really stand out to you that you're like, you know what? Yeah, that is important. And I'm not going to have you pick your three right now because that is like picking your favorite child. It's, it's going to take some time to do that. And it feels impossible at times. I would never pick my favorite child. They're both my favorite. It's just depending on the day they might vacillate. So take a moment and then in chat, I would love for you to just type in a word that stands out to you. Absolutely, Liz. Authenticity. And for me, I had to define authenticity because I feel like authenticity is one of those words that gets thrown around a lot, but it's, well, what does that mean to me? And so really understanding what your word means. Integrity. Yes. Integrity is such a good one. And that's a great touchstone for when you're in a moment that feels really difficult or that feels not aligned. Am I still holding my own integrity? Connection. How do we prioritize connect connection? Um, and I'll, I'm going to come back to that one because, John, this one is, a, is one where outlook can become an ally. Uh, intention. Susanna, love intention. Am I being thoughtful or am I being reactive? I have a, a yoga instructor that taught me in this moment, I can practice peace 
or I can practice stress. It is my choice. And the first time she told that to me, I was like, oh, I don't like that at all. Uh, but it's, am I creating more, more ease for myself or am I creating more stress for myself by being attached to an outcome or attached to how I think it should have gone? Kindness, Veronica, that's a great one. And it's a powerful one. I talk to my kids a lot about the difference between being nice and being kind. Kind isn't always soft and fuzzy, right? But it's clear and it is intentional and it is uh, thoughtful and mindful. Understanding, well-being, these are great words. And so even if you don't do the entire values exercise, take that one word that you just jotted into chat Put it on a post-it, put it on the corner of your monitor. And it's a reminder to yourself to check in and think, in this moment, is that true? Could it be more true? Could I take just half a breath and get myself back to being a bit more aligned with something that's important to me? So John, you mentioned connection. And one of the things that I think can be very important is how do we build that connection when we're remote or hybrid or running at a thousand miles per hour? And something I chose to do was to make sure I had at least one 30 minute call every week on my Outlook and I color coded it teal Everything else was like a boring kind of dull blue color. And then a couple things were like orange or red for the, oh my gosh, don't forget this. But the teal was this call is just purely for connection. And it may still help me in my work, but it's not explicitly to go solve a problem. It's to take the time to say, hey, how are you doing? How are the kids? What have you been doing lately? Uh, what projects are you working on? What's really lighting you up? What's dragging you down? And if I got to a week and I didn't see any teal, I knew I was going to be more drained. And so using it as a tool, a visual tool to be able to say, connection is important to me. Okay. How am I going to hold myself accountable that I am making time to actually connect and that it's not just the five minutes at the beginning of a call or, oh yeah, I'll definitely do that when I have time. Oh, the terrifying when I have time bucket uh, that never seems to come to pass. I'll tell you, early in my career, I had, and this is gonna tell you something, it was a Lotus Notes folder, so uh, not even an Outlook folder, but it was a folder called Rainy Day Reading. And so I might see, like somebody would send me a link and I'd be like, oh, I'll just put it in rainy day reading, rainy day reading, rainy day reading. I realized that was really essentially a delete folder. It was very sad. I'm like, those are all good things for me to absorb and to take in. And there was no rainy day. There was no day where I was out of things to do, right? And so we have to be intentional about where we spend our time. And if it's important, put it on the calendar, make it a priority, make it visual. Maybe that's that post-it note on your monitor. Maybe it's a friend checking in saying, hey, how have you integrated humor into your day today, Catherine? <laughs> Ren, I love that one. Um, I, I do think work and working with humans should be fun. Uh, I had a team that we had to do a monthly operating review. I got to tell you, those are not the most exciting slides you've ever seen. It's all graphs and numbers and blah, 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 blah. We would start every single monthly operating review with a dad joke. And the executives that we were presenting to, you could watch as their brain clicked in and they were suddenly present. They were, it was unexpected. It was a surprise. And suddenly they're like, wait, what? But they're kind of chuckling. They're kind of thinking it's weird. And yet it 
it gets people out of the, this part of my brain has a grocery list going. And this part of my brain is remembering that I forgot to pack such and such for that trip I'm taking. And this part of my brain is trying to figure out this problem for work. And then I've got this problem for work and this problem for work and this problem for work. And you've got to snap out of that, get present, get in the now, and have a little bit of fun, right? So values exercise, really important. And it was a, a big game changer for me to realize, hey, every single day, I can have a check-in with myself to say, was I authentic today? Was I clear, kind, and present? Now, here's the other beautiful thing about values. They can shift over time. You don't have to commit to this for the rest of your life, right? This is a tool that helps you to stay present and to stay focused on what's important. And so here's what happened. I realized, ah, yeah, I'm clear kind of present, but I kind of still feel like I'm not really tapping into the shiniest pieces of myself. So clear kind present was like this baseline of I am not vacating myself. I am not unaligned with myself, right? So that's my baseline. But I started to think about what about the days that I finish where I feel like being uniquely me sparkled and I added something that truly made it feel like my work is important and what I'm doing is important and I, I'm fully engaged. So clear, kind, present. Okay, I'm being true to myself. But there was something missing. And so I came back to this values exercise. And I said, okay, clear, kind, present. It's a solid baseline. I feel like I am aligned with like this kind of like, this is these things I need to be true. But the sparkly version of me needs creativity to be in my top three. And that can be in the problem solving. It can be uh, used in projects. It can be in how slides are designed, right? It doesn't have to be that I'm, you know, writing the next great American novel. Uh, so creativity, is that a part of every day? And so I said, well, I can't have four. I got to kick one of my three out and I'm pretty attached to my three. Thank you very much. So clear, kind, present, which one's going to go? And What's interesting, and perhaps a little tricksy, is one of my favorite sayings is, clear is kind. So I was like, okay, present, kind, creative. I just kind of lumped. So it, it's kind of cheating. I secretly have a fourth because kind and clear kind of go together in my book. So I'll admit maybe I'm stretching some of the rules. But it morphed into clear, no, hang on, sorry, present, kind, creative. And those are the three that have really stuck with me for a couple of years now. And it may evolve again, right? Uh, but realizing and kind of assessing, taking the time to check in with yourself. How am I feeling? Do I feel my feet on the floor? Am I sitting up straight? Have I eaten a meal today? Am I hungry? Are my fingertips cold, hot, indifferent? Knowing where you are in this present moment and that you're not just in the 9,000 emails that you're sorting through, right? You are a human being in this chair. Being in touch with that. And then at the end of each day, or at least every week, using those values to say, hmm, was this week a good week or a bad week? And I'm not saying that you're not going to have bad weeks. But if it was a bad week, what do I need to prioritize in my next week or in my next day so that I don't feel flat? And for me, that was prioritizing creativity. Uh, I will also say connection wasn't one of my top ones. But if I didn't see teal on my calendar, I knew I was going to be exhausted. And if I was in a phase like January, where everybody wants to kick off every single project and they want you to be excited about every single project. And you're like, I only have uh, this much energy and excitement. Especially in those times, 
I would make sure that there were maybe two or three teal on my calendar. Can I carve out 15 minutes to jump on a quick Zoom call with someone I care about, who I work with, or who I don't work with, that's fine. But can I take some time during my day to really connect? And what's funny is I did this, I started my teal time during COVID because I saw lots of people were suddenly working remotely for the first time. They didn't know how to have some of that water cooler chat kind of simulated experience in a remote world. And I'd worked remotely before. And so I was like, oh, I'll just, I'm gonna add some teal time. It helps me, it helps them. It helped my career so much because suddenly I'm so much more connected across the different pl planes of where I'm working, whether it's internally, externally, I have more voices coming in. I'm more connected. I understand a bigger picture. I understand what people are working on and what they care about. I know when to loop them in and when to leave them out. And so that investment of connection, which I'll tell you, there were times where I was like, is it worth it? I mean, is this a good use of my time? I've got so many other things to do. Ultimately, I work much more efficiently. I'm much more engaged in my work and I enjoy the people I work with a lot more because I've prioritized that. So you may find, yes, I wanna go pick my three values and I'm gonna to stick to those three values and that, that that's a good exercise. You may find, I'm too exhausted for that exercise, so don't put one more thing on my to-do list. Pick one word that you care about. See if you can have that word in every day for a week. Do you feel different? Do you feel a little bit more energized, a little less depleted, a little bit more engaged, a little bit more grounded in my work and myself are integrated? If yes, great, keep that word. If no, maybe pick a different word maybe ignore everything I've ever said and just walk away and be like, that's not worth my time. That's also fine. No harm, no foul. But having these touchstones to come back to can really mean that you are preventing burnout before you are already in it. One of the things that uh, I've learned is that burnout is definitely a spectrum, right? Once someone says, oh, I think I'm burnt out, they're like, toast that is black, right? You want to be keeping tabs on yourself for when maybe just one edge of the crust is getting a little too burnt, right? And so this is an exercise. It may not be the right exercise for you, but finding something where you are tapping in and saying, what's important to me? Am I honoring it? And how can I honor it a little bit more tomorrow or in the next moment? You are worth it. And once you are all ready to the crisply burnt toast, it's much harder to re-energize, right? The longer you let something go on, the harder it is to reverse it. I think about um, acupuncture. Acupuncture is cumulative and it might take several acupuncture sessions to you know, transition out some pain in a shoulder or in a, you know, leg or in a hip. But the longer that pain has been there, the longer it takes to move the pain out. So you sprain an ankle, you get some acupuncture, it helps move all of the lymph and the swelling and the, and it speeds up that recovery. You sprain an ankle and then ignore it and re-sprain it and re-sprain it and re-sprain it. It's going to take longer to recover, right? So thinking about not how do I ver avoid burnout as this destination of burnt toast, rather, how do I stay a little bit more engaged, a little bit more grounded, a little bit more myself today? And if I don't feel like it was today, and that's okay, sometimes we kind of got to check out and just plow through. Okay, today I plowed through, I kind of ignored myself and my own needs. It's not happening tomorrow. If that means I have to cancel a meeting, if it means I need to add buffers, if it means I need to actually put lunch on my calendar and mark it as out of office and walk away, do something for yourself so that you have proof of your own alliance 
to yourself. Be an advocate for yourself. Um, all right. I have talked a lot. I would love to answer questions. I would love to hear from you guys about what has resonated or what uh, you feel like would be actually helpful for you this afternoon or tomorrow. So let's let's talk a little bit. I know it's so rude when someone, when you join what you think is a one-way conversation and then you're asked to engage, it's the worst. Is there anyone who thinks that they will actually put one of the values as a post-it note on their computer? Oh, Veronica, yes. Scheduling lunch. And congratulations, Veronica, that nobody schedules over that time. I have been places where it didn't matter if you scheduled it. People just were like, I'm scheduling right over that. Uh, but it's not just scheduling it, it's holding to it. I think it's it's so important. There's so many studies that show take a nap, increase productivity, increase uh, learning retention, go exercise. Both of those things go up. Uh, and so taking care of ourselves pays dividends. And so even in that moment where you're like, I can't possibly walk away from this, I have to get it done, go do 15 jumping jacks, right? Get the blood flowing, feel your body in space and time, and then start up again. So most difficult part of the practice. Great question. I honestly think it's keeping it front of mind and not just getting sucked into the, oh, I've got so many important priorities. Like I'll think about that later. It is a uh, mental rigor that is required in order to stay present in the now that I don't think many people think of mindfulness as a rigorous exercise, but it really is because it is that my brain is a puppy and I am perpetually redirecting it back to the present moment. The puppy wants to go scamper off and eat somebody's shoes, but I've got to say, nope, what do I care about? What do I care about? What do I need to say no to in order to stay aligned and um, really present? is huge. Great question. Oh, and I hope that this question um, is hypothetical and uh, not where you're at. Have you reached the burnt toast phase? How do you get yourself out of it? I'm looking, hang on, there is a book and I want to get the title right. It's behind me somewhere. I believe it's called, it's literally called burnout. Um, usually it's right next to me. Okay. Uh, the Nagasaki, Nagasaki, Nagasaki sisters wrote it. But um, if you search Amazon for burnout and it's a book, I'll find it and share the link uh, with Rin for after the fact. But it is a really great book for understanding the physiological response of burnout. And for me, uh, I was teetering close to burned out during COVID. And it was this realization, and this book helped give me this realization, that there is stress and there is stressor. And a lot of times when you are stressed, you can say, okay, I need to get away from the stressor, right? Maybe I need to take a break from work. Maybe I need to um, you know, really press pause on a particular relationship because it's a stressor. But with COVID, we, none of us could get away from the stressor. All we could do was manage the stress. And so I feel like, uh, that kind of book, some people, um, this may resonate with some of you may be like, don't tell me to read a book if I'm burnt out. That's the worst advice I've ever heard. 
it is a helpful resource. I would say I have been, I would say perilously close to the burnt toast phase before. And what's interesting is I truly thought I wasn't. And then when I gave myself the space to say, okay, I need to, I need to kind of recover and I'm going to allow myself to nap every afternoon that I need to. And suddenly I realized it was every day and 20 minute nap, like power nap, but it was, oh, my body is more exhausted than I realized. And I would say one of the best things for me was a carving out time to nap. And I know that that's not realistic for everyone. If you work remotely, it can be slightly more realistic. Um, I don't recommend laying down on corporate carpet. I would be scared of what's in that carpet. Um, but giving yourself the space to step back and just say, can I choose now? Can I be present now? Can I try and stop multitasking some of the time? I'm, I love multitasking, but, but can I just be present and do one thing at a time? And if my brain starts to try and solve the five other problems that are blossoming, I say, nope, I'll jot them down and say, you're waiting until later. Right now I am doing this one thing. So that I do find that having some level of mindfulness exercise to bring you back can be really helpful. Um, and I, I do share quite a few of these uh, intermittently on LinkedIn. Um, but the idea of, can you feel your feet on the floor? Do you actually know if you're clinching your own jaw? Like just a list of quick questions of, do you need to pee right now? We ignore it. And then we stand up and we're like, oh, goodness, I got hurry. That is a marker of, oh, I've, I've moved out of being aware of myself and where I am in the present moment. And I, I need to get back there. And so finding what helps you to get back into that present moment and just allowing yourself to move a little bit more slowly, it's incredibly helpful. Of course, things like therapy, time off, being on a beach with no internet, like all of those things are helpful, but they're not always realistic. And so sometimes it's a commitment that, hey, every time I go to the bathroom, I'm going to do 30 seconds of deep breathing. That's your commitment to mindfulness, right? And if you're feeling really frazzled, drink more water so that you need to go to the bathroom more, right? So it's finding something really practical, really small, really doable. Because, I mean, I know I started with like, go read a book, which is like the worst. I'm sorry. I do think it's a helpful book. But just micro, uh, like re-engaging with yourself. I'm going to scroll down. I know that more uh, comments are coming in. Hopefully some of that was helpful. Um, so let's see, micro naps. Oh my gosh, love a good micro nap. Let's see, Sarah, sometimes when you work in a corporate environment, you're required to participate in a project, which if you were in charge, you would not choose to do. Uh, how do you honor your authenticity while also accomplishing what is asked of you? Great question. So I intentionally chose authenticity pieces where even if the project isn't my first choice, can I still be clear, kind, present within that project? Can I still be present, kind, creative within that project? And for me, there were definitively projects that it was like, mm this isn't how I would do it. And this is just not going to be the best way that we use our time. And right. I would get very attached to this. Isn't what, it's not a good use of my time. And either I can be very vocal about that and say like, Hey, I don't think this is a good use of my time. Here are the five projects that are being delayed because I am working on this would you agree that this is actually a lower priority than these five, right? So step one, can I get out of it? Step two, sometimes the answer is no. 
you're going to have to do it. Uh, and so then it's okay. If I stay attached to my idea that this is not the way I do it, this is not, I'm actually creating more stress for myself. So if I can say, yeah, wouldn't choose this, would definitely have opted for something slightly different. But if I hold on to my attachment to this thing that isn't right, that is not the reality I live in. Okay. I, I can grieve and say goodbye to the reality that I wish were true, but I do not live with unicorns or frolic with rainbows. So, okay, here is my new reality. What can I do in this project that is meaningful to me? Maybe it's just taking care of the other people on the project and getting to know them and actually seeing them as humans and helping them to feel like their work is worthwhile. Even if maybe I don't feel like my work is all that worthwhile on this project. Another one is to say, okay, what can I choose to do within this framework that does feel worthwhile? What would be the best possible outcome? And can I drive towards that outcome? Um, because I will tell you, there's so many stuff, projects that corporate America will say super important. And you're like, we did this three years ago and I already know that there will not be buy-in or investment to move forward, but yes, yes, we can do this. The other thing uh, that was game changing for me was to realize when I'm working on a project that feels futile, it happens. My job is to be as clear as possible for the benefits and the risks. And Sure, nothing may ever come of this project, but if I can instill in the other leaders, in whoever it is that needs this information, if I can instill in them, here are the benefits, here are the risks. If you make the choice that is riskier, from my opinion, I just want it to be very clear, because clear is kind, what those risks are. And it's not my job and it's not my responsibility to change your mind. It is my job to present very, very clearly what the risks and benefits are and make sure that you understand and have the best information possible to make an informed decision. That for me was very freeing. And I, I want to be very careful to say uh, it's not like dust your hands off and say like, not my problem, but it it is, hey, this leader has so many competing priorities that aren't relevant to my side of the business. They may choose to prioritize something that I wouldn't. That's not a personal affront. Maybe I could do a better job of presenting the information or gathering data or like what is in my control? Let me optimize that. And what is out of my control? And I'm not going to personalize it. So you decided to prioritize something else. That's okay. Let me figure out which project is next and how I do my best work in that arena. Oh yeah, Charlotte. Uh, I would joke, I was part of a professional uh, women's executive group and I'm like, guys, UTIs are not worth it. Come on, stay hydrated, go to the bathroom. Like so many people like back to back meetings and they're like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. I'm you know three minutes late. I had to go to the bathroom. I'm like, you're apologizing for a bodily function. Please don't. Uh, and please don't get a UTI um, on my account. These are great questions. Anything else that I can wax poetic? Ah, here's the book. Oh, that's the audible link, but it'll still work. It's the, I'm gonna type it in, Burnout, The Secret to Unlocking the Stress Cycle. And it's written in a very approachable way as well.
Oh, I'm so glad, Jen. Uh, I definitely need reminders of this is the only life we get. <laughs> if you don't enjoy today, it's the only today you have. Uh, so I'm glad that it resonates. And to me, the key is don't set yourself up with something um, that feels unmanageable, right? And that's why I say find a practice that brings you back to yourself that is 30 seconds or less. And sure, you may be able to expand upon that. But um, I think we all have really long to-do lists and lots of really good intentions of what we're going to do. And um, it can just then add to the overwhelm. And so finding ways of, hey, in this moment, when I'm feeling a little stressed, if I go and make my favorite kind of tea and have some afternoon tea while I'm still working and doing emails with every sip, I can remind myself like, hey, this tastes delicious. And that just that practice of I am still here, I am still human and I'm still worth paying attention to. Please connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, I, I would love to uh, continue the conversation. I do post on this kind of topic as well. Um, I hope that this feels helpful and hopeful and a little bit lighter as well, uh, because that's, that's the key, is to find that little bit of ease uh, and that little bit of lightness. Um, Ooh, good question. How do you avoid burnout when the stress may be due to internal stressors? Imposter syndrome. Oh, uh, this is a great question. Oh, somebody talks about how it shouldn't be. Imposter syndrome makes it sound like a, um, a disease and they have a different um, term for it. I'm not going to think of it right now, but <clears throat> you know how I was talking about our minds are puppy minds and you're continually redirecting it. So here's something that literally in the last six months I've had is kind of a revelation um, that, and I promise the caveat circles back. So just for a moment, I'm going to tell you about my daughter. So she comes home and something happened at recess, you know, the, these things happen, right? And she's really upset. And this internal mama bear comes out in my brain. I'm staying calm. I'm listening. I'm talking about conflict resolution. But in my brain, there is a mama bear that's like, well, how dare you? How dare this person hurt my sweet little girl, right? If you can start to really watch your thoughts and when your thoughts start in this negative direction, I want you to be your own best friend, your own mama bear. You are worth protecting. And so when you start to think, well, maybe I'm just, I can't do this. I'm not this experience. Hang on. That's not how I'm going to talk to myself. I may not have the experience that uh, I would prefer to have in this moment, but what can I choose in this moment that gets me one step closer? So imposter syndrome, uh, thinking negatively, being really having a harsh self-critic, being a perfectionist, recovering, but yes, really starting to pay attention to your own thoughts. And when they start to get that negative tinge to them, what would your best friend say if somebody was talking about you that way? Is that the way that your best friend would be like, yes, yes, you should talk about yourself that way. And really taking that step back and realizing, hang on, I have a choice in this moment. I can choose to continue down this path of I can't, I haven't, I don't know how, or I can choose something different. And that something different might be, I need to talk to somebody who's done this before and navigated their way through it. I need to talk to somebody who knows uh, how to be my cheerleader and how to just remind me of, you are radiant. This is possible. And uh, don't let your own self-doubt get in your way. Like what, what resource do you need? What assist do you need? The other one that you can choose, 
and I just lost it. Hang on. Oh, it was really relevant. I'll come back to it if it comes to me. Um, but this realization that how you think about situations and how you think about yourself is something that you can start to pay attention to and you have a choice. And so when I start to have that negative uh, feeling, I just, I choose now. Okay, what can I do in this moment? Because the spiral down, the further down you go, the more convinced you are that this is the truth and then you're heavier and then you're heavier. And, uh, I get it. But who can help me? Who can boost me up? I remember. The other is to have a hyperbole jar. Uh, so when I get into a negative space, my brain can just gerbil on something that even in that moment I know is hyperbolic. I'll never be able to do this. Really? Never? Come on. So it's when I hear never or always in my brain, I'm like, oh, hello, hyperbole. If you have a friend that can be there for you as a hyperbole jar, and I have one, and I will just text and I'll say hyperbole jar, colon. And then I'll just do this dump of all of the like, always, never. She knows that Mindy doesn't really believe that. Mindy just needs to get it out of her system and she needs to be reminded of what's important. And she needs to be reminded of uh, why she's a, a good person or a capable person or a whatever it is. If you don't have a person that can do that, ha write it down and have a literal mason jar next to you. You've got to get that always, never, heavy, just negative. And telling yourself, no, you, you can't think that. If you're in, if you're stuck in that loop, it's hard to get out of it by just sheer will sometimes. Sometimes, at least for me, I need to have the verbal vomit. I need to write it out just so that I can look at it and be like, of course, that's not true. It's not 100% true. It's not 50% true. But I got to get it out somehow. Uh, so having a buddy um, for that hyperbole jar can be really, really helpful. And sometimes if it's a loved one, they think you're serious and they try and problem solve. Uh, and if it's truly hyperbolic and it's uh, I'm never going to feel good about this and I'm never going to be able to do it. And I'll never like you don't need to problem solve. You just need to get it out. Uh, and so that's where, you know, hyperbole jar. Now, if it's truly a problem that needs solving, that's kind of a different thing. All right. Well, I think we are coming to the end of our time here with Mindy. Folks, I hope you enjoyed this as much as I did. I love the idea and the concept of a hyperbole jar. <laughs> I know that when I get into that mind space, everything is always and never, and I am the drama. So um, <laughs> I love it. Mindy, this has been wonderful. Thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us and to share your techniques. Um, you shared your LinkedIn in the chat. We, we've put it up there a couple more times. Is there anything else that you would like to share with us? Where else can we find you? Anything you'd like to promote? I would say LinkedIn is uh, the main spot right now. I am compiling some of this into a potential book for kind of mere uh, mindfulness for mere mortals uh, with lots of 30 second exercises, 45 second exercises, because we're all too busy to think about a two week silent retreat. Uh, but that is not available as a book yet. And so I would recommend uh, finding me on LinkedIn because that's where I tend to share these. Awesome. Well, I know I've already sent you a request to connect on LinkedIn. Uh, we can't wait to hopefully see more of you um, and 
see that book. That book sounds like just right up my alley. So thank you again. And thank you to everybody who attended. Come join us over at Proposal Industry Experts, where we are being authentic, we are being inclusive, and we are keeping our sanity here in 2024. Thank you all again. And thank you, Mindy. Everybody have a great rest of the week.